start the recording um, now. So, uh, good day, good day, everyone. Again, this is um, <clears throat> Willem Janssen. Um, I'm an associate professor of um, EU and Dutch public procurement law at Utrecht University at the Law School, and I'd like to greatly welcome you here and thank you for joining this online seminar on the very exciting um, foreign subsidies regulation. There's lots to be said about it, um, and I'd like to just make note of the fact that this event is being organized by the research project Public Interest Ecosystems. In, um, in which we research hybrid collaboration between public and private parties in light of public interest within the context of enforcement and regulation um, within Europe and mostly within the context of EU economic law, hence also the reason why we're talking about the foreign uh, subsidies regulation. And we do that today and we team up with another research project uh, which also takes place within the center of regulation and enforcement in Europe, Renforce, with the EU values in international trade um, project. Now, before I give the floor to our hopefully kind yet strict chair, uh, Dr. Ursula Yeremba, Associate Professor of, of the EU Law at our law school, I'd like to just make a quick note of the organizational aspects, which are relatively simple. We have about two hours um, to discuss <clears throat> four perspectives based on this foreign subsidies regulation, but please mute your microphone. And should you have any questions, please just note them along the way in the chat box and we'll address them in the discussions um, and um, Ursula will uh, kindly take the lead in that. Can I give the floor to you, uh, Ursula, to uh, to commence the content of this uh, meeting? Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Willem. I'm just checking whether you can hear me. Yes, excellent. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you to this indeed very exciting seminar, which I'm uh, going to chair and introduce you to the world of this absolutely absorbing EU foreign um, subsidies regulation, which has entered into force quite recently. My name is Ursula Eremba. I'm Associate Professor of European Union Law, and I'm very glad to have uh, four excellent speakers uh, who will shed some more light on the mentioned, uh, mentioned regulation from their own legal perspective. So we have today uh, Thomas Verellen, uh, we have Jasper Sluis, uh, Willem Janssen and Anna Marholt, um, all excellent experts uh, in their field who are going to um, share their views on the on this interesting foreign subsidies regulation. Um, so without further uh, further ado, uh, let me introduce some um, some basic uh, aspects of the of the regulation. So perhaps the best thing uh, to start with is why is the regulation uh, adopted in the first place? So um, the objective of the um, of the regulation is to address distortions on the internal market caused by foreign subsidies. That is to say subsidies which are granted by non-EU countries. Um, so differently stated, it aims at preventing foreign subsidies from distorting competition in the European Union or in their internal market of the European Union. And as you might know, subsidies granted um, to undertakings by member states are regulated by the state aid regime, whereas foreign subsidies uh, were not captured by this uh, by this regime. So the, this regulation it's an example of sort of a fireball regulation. It is uh, the proposal was there in May 2021, um, and the regulation was adopted by the EU institutions by December last year, which can definitely be seen uh, classified as a pretty fast um, legislative track. Uh, so the act is in force since 12 January 2023 this year, and will start to apply as of 12 of July 2000. 23. Um, in the meantime, perhaps you've seen that there is already a draft of implementing regulation proposed by the Commission regarding the procedural aspects um, of the regulation, and this draft was there already in, uh, on the 6th of uh, February, uh, and now it is ongoing uh, consultation. Interestingly, the regulation has a dual uh, legal basis, so it is uh, based on Article uh, 207 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, so common commercial policy, and Article 
114, so the, of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, so the internal market legal basis. And the general idea behind how the regulation is going to work is to investigate foreign subsidies that distort the internal market and to redress such distortions. And in this respect, um, uh, the regulation also places um, uh, ex ante notification obligation on undertaking. So something that perhaps um, you may recall from the merger regulation. And clearly, so clearly the adopted regulation um, is, uh, is there to fill the loophole in the legal system of the European Union. And it is also supposed to complement the different regulatory regimes in the European Union uh, that do not have this capacity to capture foreign subsidies. Um, so in that sense, it complements the general, generally the EU competition rules, um, so the state aid, merger control, antitrust in general. It complements the, the public procurement rules, also including the more recent international procurement instrument. And um, it also complements the external trade instruments, so anti-subsidy regulation, the free trade agreements, uh, the SSC, uh, uh, SCM agreement, excuse me, and the screening of foreign direct investment screening regulation. And it is perhaps worthwhile to, uh, worthwhile to add that the regulation also carries some of the institutional features of those different of those different regimes. And um, so what are the essential aspects of the mechanism which are my colleagues uh, are going to um, to reflect upon? So first, um, the regulation provides for a broad, pretty broad definition of a foreign subsidy and you will find it in Article 3 of the regulation. And a foreign subsidy exists where a third country provides directly or indirectly a financial contribution which conf uh, confers a benefit on undertaking, engaging in economic activity, internal market, and which is limited in law or in fact to one or more other undertakings or industries. So I'm citing now from the, from the regulation. And this, um, those financial contributions are pretty broad, um, broad, uh, broadly understood. They include, for instance, capital injections, grants, loans, uh, loan uh, uh, guarantees, um, fiscal intense, uh, incentives, the setting of operational losses, and so forth. So um, it's a pretty uh, broad uh, definition of what is actually a foreign subsidy um, in the framework of this regulation. Second, um, how shall we understand the notion of distortion of competition? This you will find in Article 4 of the, um, of the set regulation. And a, a distortion in the internal market shall be deemed to exist where a foreign subsidy is liable to improve the competitive, uh, competitive position of an undertaking in the internal market and where in doing so that foreign subsidy actually or potentially negatively affects competition in the internal market. It is generally assumed that um, a foreign subsidy that does not exceed, uh, exceed, uh, exceed 4 million euro um, over any consecutive period of three years uh, shall be considered unlikely to distort the internal market and um, um, foreign subsidy, um, where the total amount of foreign subsidy uh, to an undertaking in the European Union does not exceed the uh, minimum of 200,000 euros over any period of three fiscal years, that foreign subsidy is not considered to distort the internal market. And then we have the very essential elements, so those are the tools which are there um, in this regulation. And the regulation uh, foresees three general uh, mechanisms or tools. And the first one is the, the, the ex ante authorization of uh, mergers. So it's a mandatory ex ante authorization of mergers, meaning that there is a um, notification obligation for undertakings engaging in concentration in European Union 
if an aggregate EU-wide turnover um, is um, at least 500, mil, uh, 500 million euros in the previous financial year. I'm, I'm not going to mention all the details here because I could uh, uh, go on for, uh, for long, but just the, the general lines. So the first tool which is there is the ex-ante authorization of mergers and acquisition. The second one um, is the uh, mandatory, also mandatory ex-ante authorization obligation for companies engaging in public um, procurement tenders. And meaning that there is a notification obligation for on the undertakings if the contract value of the respective tender uh, is equal or uh, above uh, 250 million euro. And then we have the third tool, which is a sort of um, ex post catch all market investigation uh, powers given to the European um, uh, to the European Commission, which in practice practice means that the Commission may ex officio also investigate all potentially distortive um, foreign subsidies. So those um, free tools is something that also my colleagues will reflect upon in their presentations. And finally, we have also um, um, the regulation grants the Commission the authority to propose redressive measures and also to accept commitments from companies. So um, yes, you hear me saying it. This is probably my most striking um, feature of this uh, regulation is, um, in particular, from the um, from the institutional law perspective, are uh, those very extensive, exclusive competences of the European Commission in implementing and applying the regulation. So the Commission is granted far-reaching investigative powers, uh, it can impose fines, it can impose aggressive measures, it can accept commitments, um, and the investigative powers resemble those that we know, for instance, from the field um, of antitrust, including powers to request information, uh, conduct inspections on the uh, undertaking's premises, and so forth. So having said that, um, this regulation is a very absorbing um, act of the European Union and it raises many pretty fundamental questions which I'm sure our speakers will um, uh, going, are, or are going to shed some light on. Uh, those questions relate to the issues of uh, uh, clearly rising um, protectionism in the light of the changing geopolitical situation in the world which is then also linked to the issue of increasing unilateralization of EU trade policy. This in turn, uh, turn links to the topic of the relation of the new regime with the rules of WTO, um, which for instance Anna uh, is going to reflect upon uh, from the institutional point of view, um, questions regarding um, or related to uh, the wide ranging enforcement powers of the Commission um, can be posed, so the discretion of the Commission um, and also the way it will carry carry out the balance, uh, balancing acts, uh, the various procedural aspects attached to the regulation. Uh, here I see Thomas um, in particular will be reflecting and uh, reflecting on those aspects. There is a question um, of how the balancing act by the Commission will be uh, will be done. Um, there is a question whether same standards will be applied for different situations. So when you compare intra and extra EU situations. And then finally, the question of definitely increasingly uh, or piling uh, regulation in the European Union, overlapping regulation in the European Union. Um, the relation of it to, um, to the state aid merger regime. And um, but also its relation to the public procurement. So that's something that um, Jasper and Thomas will uh, reflect upon. Um, yes, and this touches upon questions of legal sanctity um, and in general the burden for companies um, which um, which this new regime places on our undertakings in the European Union. So having said that, I give the floor to our first speaker, that is uh, Thomas Verellen. And um, Thomas will be then followed by Jasper Slash. 
So Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ursula. Does my microphone work? Yeah, great, because I came in a little bit late, so I was concerned about the IT situation. Um, I will talk for uh, a few minutes about the institutional um, the institutional aspects of this regulation. Um, I'm interested in governance and who decides what uh, the procedures by which EU institutions, EU bodies reach their decisions and the legitimacy that they have or maybe lack uh, in certain situations. How should we organize our institutional framework? Um, <clears throat> I'll say a few words about the procedures that have been introduced by this regulation. I'll then uh, turn to the balancing test, which Ursula mentioned, which I also find uh, very interesting. And then I'll embed uh, or I'll zoom out a bit and look at the broader picture of, it was also mentioned by Ursula, this turn, this unilateral turn that we see happening in the EU's trade policy. Because as was mentioned, this foreign subsidies regulation is an internal, but also an external instrument. It is a has a dual legal basis, one of them being com common commercial policy. First about the procedure. So do I have control over the slides? Can I, or I can take control? Yes, yeah. please take, uh, take control, yeah. Okay, excellent. The first thing that you notice when you look at the uh, procedural dimension of this regulation is that it puts in place a centralized system of enforcement. Again, it has been mentioned, but it, I find it really striking. We have the European Commission responsible for the start of investigations, for conducting the invent investigations, for adopting decisions, uh, imposing redressive measures, accepting commitments or decisions in which uh, the Commission concludes it has no objections against a particular foreign subsidy. So the Commission is at the heart of the system. It is a centralized system. So unlike what we have in competition law, there is no concurrent jurisdiction whereby both national and EU authorities have a role to play. There is no one shop system whereby there is a division of labor. It is more akin to the trade defense uh, arrangements. So we have the Commission uh, and that is it. It was mentioned three um, Let's see, how can I go to the next slide? There are three procedures. The first one I call uh, the default procedure, whereby the Commission can conduct an ex officio review. So it can, on its own initiative, start an investigation. This too, and I often make the comparison to trade defense, because that's an area in which I have a bit of, a, a bit of experience. That also exists in the trade defense context, but is very rarely used, usually, a complaint is lodged and then the Commission will start an investigation. Here the Commission, uh, there is no complaint mechanism apart for the um, concentrations and public procurement, but so it is not necessary. The philosophy seems to be Commission starts its own investigations. In two steps, first a preliminary review and if there are signs that uh, we may be faced, the Commission may be faced with a distortive foreign subsidy it can proceed to the next phase, an in-depth investigation. Interim measures can be adopted and then final measures, which is also something you see in the trade defense context. But, and here is another important difference that I really want to highlight. Everything works under the so-called advisory procedure. Advisory procedure, that means comitology system, Comitology, that means we have a committee of member state experts that keeps an eye on what is happening and that needs to take a position on a proposed, a draft implementing act. So any measure the Commission wants to undertake, interim measures or the final decisions, they need to go through this comitology procedure. Again, this is something we know from the trade defence context. It does not exist in the competition law context. One important difference, however, with, if you, want, if you wish, traditional trade defense is that in the trade defense context, so if you think about anti-dumping measure, countervailing measures, interim measures can be adopted by uh, means of the advisory procedure. 
And so what does advisory procedure mean? That means member state experts need to give an opinion, but the commission holds the decision making power. Whereas the final decisions in trade defense are adopted under the examination procedure. What does that mean? It means that same committee of member states can block a proposed measure by means of a qualified majority. So a reverse qualified majority requirements whereby member states can oppose a measure by qualified majority and if necessary a, an appeal can be followed. That structure is not used in the for the foreign subsidy regulation. Everything happens under the advisory procedure. So that means more leeway for the commission, less uh, input from the member state sides, less ability to uh, oppose and block measures. So that I think is really an important difference uh, and this is, just brings the instrument closer to the competition law state aid instruments than it brings it to the uh, and uh, trade defense instruments. We have the default procedure, uh, a slightly different procedure under for certain concentrations, so notifiable uh, concentrations. I won't enter into details about what exactly that is. Ursula mentioned already there are certain uh, thresholds. Upon a notification, the Commission starts an investigation, similar structure, one difference uh, being the outcome. You do not have redressive measures. You can have a decision that prohibits the concentration from taking place. Remember, this is an ex ante procedure. Then under public procurement, there too, an obligation to notify certain foreign financial contributions. And then again, the same system except no interim measures possible under uh, the public procurement uh, procedure. And the outcome is also different because the nature of the procedure is different. The decision to prohibit the award of the contract uh, is a possibility. So three procedures that work uh, in parallel. It is still possible for the Commission to start its own investigation ex officio, even if we don't have uh, a procedure that is started under the other. Uh, tools, we can call them. Comitology, I mentioned advisory opinion. What does that mean? It means a lot of discretion for the Commission, as I mentioned, and very few checks. So member state experts only in advice. They can only give their advice. Council and European Parliament play no real role in this procedure, so they cannot block a measure as they could, as they can for certain other instruments where the Commission operates by delegated act. They can, however, argue, raise a, a yellow flag, if you wish, uh, by saying that a certain measure goes beyond the powers that have been uh, allocated to the Commission. It's an ultra virus argument. It's available to both Council and Parliament. If they raise this yellow flag, the Commission needs to reconsider its measure, um, but they cannot stop the Commission from proceeding. So important first point, lots of power for the Commission lots of discretionary power also, which brings me to the second point, the new balancing test. Over here I have a slide that uh, summarizes a little bit how the comitology system works. So as you see from the draft decision of advisory committee straight to the implementing act, no appeal procedure as I described earlier. Second feature that I find interesting about this regulation is the way that this balancing test has been formulated. On this slide, you can see how the union interest test is formulated in the anti-dumping regulation. So here the commission is invited by the EU legislature to look at the various interests taken as a whole. And based on an appreciation of all these interests, the commission can decide to impose or not impose measures, even if we are in the presence of dumping. So that has been established in some instances, depending on the various interests at stake, the Commission is still allowed not to impose measures. Something that is uh, pretty unique uh, to the EU does not exist in jurisdictions like the United States. Relevant here is that is the term interests. So these are interests, material interests. So what the Commission does is it looks at uh, what would imposing anti-dumping measures mean for EU producers or for EU consumers, um, EU importers, EU exporters? It looks at material interests and then will make an overall assessment of these interests. 
in the foreign subsidies relation, something more is going on. You still have those material interests that are being balanced against one another. So on the one hand, the distortive effect of the foreign subsidy against a possible positive impact that that uh, subsidy may have on the overall development of the economic activity concerned. But in addition, and this is the interesting bit, the regulation also invites the Commission to consider other positive effects of the subsidy, such as the broader positive effects in relation to the relevant policy objectives, in particular those of the Union. Relevant policy objective, objectives, plural, not defined. So the Commission is here asked to look at other objectives, could be environmental protection, could be labour standards, whatever is considered relevant at any given moment in time can be included and has to be included, shall be taken into account, the next paragraph says, in the analysis. So it will be very interesting to see how the Commission deals with this. The balancing test will be further elaborated on in a communication which has to be adopted in the next three years, where the factors that the Commission will look at will be further explained. So th this, I think, is a meaningful um, development. We, there are discussions in, of a similar nature in competition law, but to the Dutch uh, lawyers present, the Kip van Morgenzaak, where the Dutch Competition Authority was asked to look at non-economic objectives in its competition law analysis. Very controversial. Here, we now know it has to happen. We cannot just look at material interests. This then goes back to this question of checks on the Commission. So the Commission is asked to look at non-economic factors, um, but is, does the Commission have the institutional legitimacy to do so? And what are the remedies? What are the, the checks on the Commission? The most obvious one is judicial review by the Court of Justice. How will the Court of Justice deal with uh, cases in which this balancing test becomes uh, uh, is challenged, like to what extent shall there be deference uh, to the Commission? So questions of institutional legitimacy that arise there. Final point, um, building a unilateral trade policy toolbox. Open strategic autonomy is the key word here. The EU has in the past couple of years been building uh, and modernizing its existing, well, has been modernizing its existing instruments, trade defense, and has been adopting new instruments such as this instrument, but also the foreign direct investment screening regulation mentioned earlier, the anti-coercion instrument, which is currently in trilogue negotiations. So the trade defense toolbox is much larger today than it was a couple of years ago. And very interesting to see is that there is much diversity in the way decisions are taken. Uh, I add here also restrictive measures think of Ukraine, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. These are also measures that affect trade. And I also added uh, the competition instruments at the bottom. Wide diversity of instruments, unanimity in council, all the way to commission deciding completely on its own without comitology. So there you have questions of, is this, uh, how coherent is this? Why is one instrument chosen for one, uh, one procedure chosen for one instrument and another for another one? Um, this is something that I think in future should be reconsidered uh, to make this a system that uh, provides for sufficient checks and balances. And then to end with, end with one, perhaps a comment, a question. It's interesting, I find that the Commission is introducing this instrument to tackle foreign subsidies. And at the same time, uh, we have several large member states pleading for more subsidies. We need to respond to what the United States is doing with the Inflation Reduction Act. We need, we need an industrial policy, more subsidies, more subsidies, but they have to be European subsidies. So foreign subsidies, that is treated in, so, in a somewhat different way. Uh, questions of coherence are maybe uh, in order there. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, uh, uh, for your insights. Um, you see the presentation now was stopped. Well, okay, you know. Thank you for your insights. Um, if you Pleasure. have any questions, if you have any questions to Thomas, you can put them uh, in the chat, and we will discuss them later. Um, now I give the floor to Jasper, who is going to present 
the perspective more from the, uh, the perspective on the um, on the regulation, looking from merger control and state aid. And I'm waiting for our slides. Yes. yes Thank you, uh, Ursula. Yeah, let me take control of the slide deck. OK, there we are. OK, um, so thank you uh, for being here. Thank you for giving me uh, the opportunity to uh, share my thoughts on the uh, FSR. Um, my name is Jasper Sluis. I am uh, Assistant Professor of uh, Competition and Regulatory Law uh, at Utrecht University. Um, today I'm joining you by way of uh, Singapore, uh, where I'm currently a visiting scholar at the National University of Singapore. Um, it is uh, 10.30 uh, at night uh, for me now, uh, so this is a nightly uh, seminar. Um, all right. So the uh, the FSR, at least from the perspective of, of state aid and competition law, aims to end the situation where uh, competition lawyers on the one hand and state aid lawyers on the other uh, were pointing at each other uh, and not doing anything. There was this twilight zone between the two fields and uh, the FSR uh, tries to uh, address that twilight zone. Um, and uh, what I find exciting uh, about the regulation is that now for the first time we have an interdisciplinary approach to broader market governance, to a broader market governance uh, phenomenon, uh, combining otherwise separate but related legal fields, um, competition law and state aid law in this case. And going forward in uh, the time that I've left, and let me set my alarm for that, um, I wish to address three specific implications of the foreign subsidies regulation on the EU rules on competition. And I'll focus on state aid, uh, abuse of dominance, and uh, merger control. Um, so first off, uh, state aid law. And uh, the premise is, is quite straightforward here. Um, so state aid law only applies to EU governments and uh, not to governments of third countries. And in the past, this created an unbalanced playing field um, as uh, third country governments could subsidize uh, undertakings with impunity while on the other hand, European governance had to, had to comply with a state aid law. And uh, uh, an example here uh, of, of, you know, those uh, circumstances would be uh, Huawei, uh, which enjoyed massive uh, state subsidies from the Chinese state and was thus able to get a very strong foothold in European markets. Um, and what we see is that in this respect, the FSR sets up a framework that is quite similar to EU state aid law with um, what is called a distortive foreign subsidy, um, which is quite similar to the incompatible state aid concept in state aid law. We have the preliminary and formal uh, procedure um, of state aid law as compared to the preliminary and in-depth procedure of uh, the FSR. And we have certain redressive measures uh, for the Commission, um, for instance, in imposing or accepting uh, commitments by undertakings. Um, however, I see some key differences between uh, the two uh, legal regimes. And first and foremost, um, the FSR uh, targets undertakings, not uh, states, right? And that is a key difference in the way uh, these two instruments are uh, set up. And uh, moreover, um, 
the foreign subsidies regulation does not require a notification, but rather is set up as an uh, ex post enforcement tool uh, by the Commission, where the Commission can ex officio investigate suspected cases of distortive uh, foreign subsidies. Um, and then there's a couple of aspects of the FSR that made me uh, consider um, whether or not the FSR is actually stricter than the um, uh, state aid framework. Um, so first, um, the uh, enforcement arsenal of the Commission is more extans expansive than under the state aid regime, right? So uh, particularly the uh, inspections of undertakings are altogether absent under the state aid regime. However, uh, the commission is able to uh, to inspect undertakings uh, in a way similar as in competition law. Um, then we see uh, the, at least up until this point, absence of block exemption uh, regulations, right? So in the um, state aid regime, we have uh, had the development of a parallel regime of block exemption regulations, uh, providing context and and um, uh, social uh, political um, backing to uh, the application of the state aid regime, and and we don't see that here uh, at all. Um, and then I find that the balancing objective that is inherent in both instruments is altogether different. So state aid law tries to balance uh, national uh, protectionism with the internal market perspective, but at least both players are on the same team, right? So both the commission and the member state at least belong to the EU. Um, and the Commission itself is very active in ex ante aid schemes in the development of the, uh, the block exemption regulation. And these aligned objectives between the Commission and member states for the um, state aid regime are altogether absent in the FSR, right? So uh, the recipients and the um, uh, subsidizers of um, uh, foreign uh, subsidies are on a completely different team. And this makes the FSR more prone uh, for conflict than uh, the state aid regime. All right, uh, so let me move on to uh, dominance. And this is somewhat overlooked. Um, so to my knowledge, uh, this has not been brought up uh, in the context of uh, the foreign subsidies regulation. Um, and the premise here is that um, dominance uh, is the, be, uh, the ability to act independently of competitors. And we can see this in situations where uh, third country SOEs leverage their capital into adjacent markets, which can have distortive effects. And we see this happening a lot in sports, right? So where um, airlines from uh, Gulf countries invest heavily in uh, sports teams, sports leagues uh, in the EU, which has all sorts of ripple effects in terms of advertising uh, and uh, other ad adjacent, excuse me, uh, markets. And uh, here we, um, the Commission can enforce uh, ex officio and impose, me impose measures uh, similar to the behavioral and structural measures in competition enforcement. Um, right, so the behavioral measures that uh, the Commission can impose are uh, obliging a friend access, fair and reasonable uh, non discriminatory access, uh, publication of R&D results, but also structural. Uh, remedies. So uh, reducing capacity or market presence, uh, presence or even asset divestment. And um, my reflection on this as a competition lawyer 
is that this can be seen within the broader trend of um, widening the scope of Article 102 TFEU on abuse of dominance, like um, um, the uh, Digital Markets Act, which got enacted uh, two years ago. Um, so you see 102 TFEU like enforcement powers of the Commission, uh, but without the need to actually establish abuse. Um, establishing a uh, distortive, uh, uh, whether or not a foreign subsidy is distortive, is an altogether lower bar than establishing abuse of dominance. Um, however, if you consider what the rationale behind uh, abuse of dominance is, and um, which is re-establishing competition on the merits between firms, um, this kind of got me thinking as well. Right? So if anything is not competition on the merits, then it is competition or uh, you know, beating the competition premised on massive subsidies uh, from uh, foreign governments or uh, foreign uh, state-owned uh, enterprises. Right, so um, this needs to be hashed out uh, more obviously, right? But it's something I will be paying attention to as a competition lawyer uh, going forward. Now then, uh, finally, um, where I find the uh, FSR to be most impactful uh, as it relates to competition law is um, mergers. Um, so, what the FSR uh, focuses on uh, are state uh, subsidized acquisitions, mainly of firms. And a prime example here would be Costco shipping, uh, which has been uh, eating up a lot of European uh, ports and uh, parts of uh, ports, so port terminals, uh, for instance. Um, and the FSR here provides a uh, review system that is parallel to the European uh, merger uh, regulation, the EUMR. Uh, so in a quite similar uh, fashion. So with notification, with a turnover thresholds, with a standstill procedure, right? So where you may not implement the merger until it has been cleared and with a certain uh, decisions by the Commission, so clearing uh, the, uh, the merger, prohibiting the merger, or attaching uh, conditions. Um, however, the key difference is that the turnover threshold, as Ursula alluded to before, uh, it takes uh, two stages now. So there's the 500 million um, EU turnover, uh, threshold, and then the second threshold of a 50 million financial contribution over, if I'm not mistaken, uh, three years. Now, my reflection on this uh, as a competition lawyer and also as, as someone who's, who's worked in, in mergers uh, in the past is uh, I can imagine this being incredibly burdensome for uh, merging parties. Um, I don't think a lot of firms uh, now keep records of the financial contributions they've received from uh, third party uh, governments. Uh, they will have to do so uh, going forward. Uh, and that will be quite a uh, bureaucratic uh, hurdle uh, for them. Um, then you could um, consider the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the ability of the Commission to request notification of uh, uh, a concentration, an impeding concentration, as a shorthand for the Article 22 uh, procedure of the European merger uh, regulation, right? Um, it, it's, it would significantly lower the bar of an Article 22 uh, procedure. 
Um, so the commission has more power to force um, prospective concentrations to be notified. Um, so procedurally, that's lower bar, uh, but also substantively. Um, in my view, it is a lot easier for the commission to establish that a financial contribution is distortive than it is for that same commission to um, establish a significant impediment to effective competition under the uh, EU uh, merger regulation. The bar for that is a lot higher. Um, so in many cases, I suspect that we are moving towards a system of dual uh, merger control, right? So where the same uh, prospective concentration between firms is subject to both the EUMR and the FSR, um, which will uh, uh, tremendously uh, raise uh, transaction costs uh, for firms. Now, considering um, all these uh, potential impacts in the field of, of competition uh, on the EU rules of competition together, um, I do think, uh, and this, by the way, is, is Anu Bradford's a wonderful book, The Brussels Effect, so where she discusses how the, uh, the EU in many ways is a flag bearer and a standardizer of, of regulation, right? So um, because the EU standard is the highest in many fields, uh, the rest of the world, and particularly uh, the business world, automatically complies to the highest standards, elevating uh, everything else. And uh, we see in competition, however, and in state aid, that the Brussels effect does not work, right? Um, so here, uh, the, the uh, state aid regime particularly is the gold standard uh, in terms of uh, protectionism or combating protectionism, but the rest of the world has not caught up with that. Right, so in that sense, the FSR shields or protects the internal market where the Brussels effect uh, hasn't been delivering. And um, then what I, as a competition law scholar, find exciting is that we have this hybrid tool of competition, low state aid, and public uh, procurement uh, enforcement. So I'm really excited to see how this is going to play out in practice. Um, not only am I exciting, excited as an academic, I think practitioners will also be very excited about this regulation um, because uh, firms will be left uh, scrambling uh, to comply, particularly in the field of uh, mergers. So uh, with that, I, um, I would like to, uh, to close. Um, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to any questions that uh, you may have. And thank you. Thank you, Jasper, for your very insightful presentation. I see no questions in the chat, but perhaps uh, those, who are, those who want to ask a question can do it now. I see Oles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for, for organizing this fantastic event, really informative and easy to follow. Um, on, on the last point about uh, the, the Brussels effect uh, on state aid, I think there could be, I, I definitely see the logic with, with a caveat, though, that uh, state aid, it's, it's quite a specific EU phenomenon. It's, it's more probably about market integration than about competition and most of, of uh, jurisdictions, even federal jurisdictions, don't face so significant challenges about market integration. It's just a caveat. Otherwise, thank you very much indeed. Pleasure to listen. Yeah, point well taken, uh, Olesh. Um, thank you. Yeah, I have very little to add there. Any other questions? I see Siba. Siba first. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you for, for all three wonderful presentations um, of you. 
Uh, I have also a, a, a small question uh, regarding the last one on, on the Brussels effect, because what kind of standards do you actually mean then? I was not quite sure if I understood you, Jasper, correctly about, um, because normally it's referred to, for example, data protection or these kind of, you know, standards of public interest. Um, I, I could not really relate it to um, here uh, when you talk about state aids or competition. And, and yeah, of course, there are other markets. Think about the US, for example, where you have similar kind of approaches when it comes to, uh, you know, foreign uh, shielding their market from foreign investments. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Siva. Um, so this um, I uh, brought up mainly relating uh, to the state aid regime, um, which is unparalleled, uh, really, in, in terms of, of the way it tries to, to uh, tackle protectionism. Um, and what we've seen in, in many fields, so uh, say uh, data protection, as, as you brought up, uh, is that once the EU implements uh, 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 a regime that is stricter than, than everything else, there's two uh, developments happening. So first, uh, uh, firms worldwide start complying to the EU standard because it's the highest, highest standard. And if you apply to the EU standard, you apply to everything else. Plus, um, these initiatives are followed by other uh, governments implementing similar uh, regulatory regimes. And so this has been wildly successful in, in privacy and data protection. Um, however, it's been this development has been altogether lagging uh, with uh, state aid. So that's the point I was trying to make there. And I see Ali. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the interesting talks. Um, I was wondering uh, the scope of the FSR, in what ways could a foreign country like game the system, uh, perhaps uh, using private venture capitalists that invest in heavy subsidized countries in their home countries and use that money that they make the profits to invest as a non uh, state-owned company in uh, EU uh, uh, companies. Um, perhaps it's a wrong example, but do you see any um, possibilities for foreign countries to pierce the system of the FSR? So I think Thomas is best equipped for this one, right? Thomas? I was going to say yes, but it's best equipped for this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, well, um, not equipped to answer this if I, if yeah. I, if I just, I, I do think there's, a, there's one, but I, I honestly would have to look it up, but I do think there's an anti-abuse provision uh, somewhere in this regulation where uh, when we look at the definition of what is uh, like a foreign, like a foreign government, like that definition is a bit broader than you would might first expect. So maybe that would be one a way to deal with this issue. But I really couldn't say more than that. Well, and yeah, perhaps um, to say. subsidies are caught directly and indirectly uh, per Article Three of the uh, the FSR. Uh, right, so I, I guess this was constitute constitute an indirect uh, foreign subsidy there, uh, Ali. Okay. The yes. example you brought up. Yeah. Similar to state aid law. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Other questions. No. I see Willem. Uh suggesting to check Article 39 for the last question, I assume. If there are no other questions, um, then I suggest we have a very short break. We stretch our legs, uh, grab a coffee, and let's meet again. Well, um, well what shall we say? Four o'clock then? Just a very, very quick... Uh,
quick break. So see you in a few minutes. Okay, welcome back. I'll wait a few more seconds. I see our speakers back in the room. <laughs> 
so um, after those two very insightful presentations, we have uh, we have two more by uh, Dylan, which will uh, give his public procurement perspective, and uh, by Anna Anna Marhold, who is going to uh, reflect on the regulation from uh, from the point of view of World Trade Organization rules. So I guess Willem, uh, I give the floor to you, and uh, I can't see the slides, so I don't know whether you would like to upload them. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Ursula. Uh, the slides are uploaded, oh, yes. so I'm yes, I not see. sure if Jasper could confirm or Thomas that you can see slides. Okay. Yes, can, all right, I see. Some. I can see the slides. Yeah, I can see them. Yeah, there you go. Oh, Fantastic. Really? That's a, that's at least two people that can see them. That's that's uh, better than no one. Um, thank you so much for the floor, uh, Ursula. Um, I have the privilege to discuss some uh, public procurement questions related to the FSR, and I'll I'll take the viewpoint of law and practice a bit. And um, alongside concentrations um, uh, that was broadly discussed by by Jasper just then, it's the, the the major second leg or focus point of the FSR. And I think in general, it highlights that public procurement at the moment is it's, it's even more becoming uh, at the center of European law and policy. And often it's seen as like a lever to effectuate policy change or changes in practice or behavior on the internal market. So I think we should see the FSR also in this context where it's really the systemic umbrella that we find ourselves. And the, the, the EU legislator, interestingly, is also added to that, that the reason why they're regulating this is also because of the economic significance of public procurement. References made to the taxpayers' money as well. And in, in a way that's that's a little bit vague, I find, and abstract, but I think the underlying assumption is, is that, and also perhaps in a political sense, is that because this is such a big portion of the EU uh, GDP and because it is taxpayers' money, we should not have foreign you know, beneficiaries or, or foreign entities uh, benefit from those public contracts. So we should bar them in, in terms of access. So in my in my brief presentation, I'll do two things. <clears throat> I'll highlight some aspects that I think exemplify how public procurement plays a role in the FSR. What position does it take? What effects take place? Um, and I'll leave you with five points of discussion for the future. And I think there's probably much more to discuss and most likely. Um, but um, given the time, I'll cherry pick a bit. Um, I'll talk a bit about effectiveness, about the scope, about delays and uncertainty, about administrative burdens and about legal protection. So that's a bit of a, a cliffhanger. Um, so if we um, if we delve into that, the really the gatekeeping concept of the, the public procurement part of uh, the FSR, the chapter that is devoted to it, um, is the, the first um, uh, definition, which really uh, focuses on <clears throat> foreign subsidies that could cause or uh, risk causing a distortion in, in a public procurement procedure. So it's really focused on one procedure and most more specifically that that must be understood as foreign subsidies that enable an unduly advantageous position, right? So because of the fact that foreign, a foreign subsidy was received, one economic operator is put in an unduly advantageous position, and that's something that we do not desire, um, briefly said. So throughout this chapter, particularly in terms of public procurement, you see this balancing act that takes place. And you see highlights of it popping up more strongly or less strongly. And I think key ingredients have been protection of the internal market, of course, effective enforcement of this regulation, but then to counterbalance that is uh, maintaining access for small and medium sized enterprises and mostly also an attempt to keep administrative burdens at a minimum. So I think those ingredients have really shaped this part of the uh, of the FSR. And ultimately, when, how that balancing act has also come to the forefront, I think the question will be in the future how important this unduly advantageous discussion will become. Will this really become a gatekeeper um, uh, um, role or and the causal link that is required with the foreign subsidy or not? Something that I'll get back to uh, in a bit. When we then look at the limitation of scope or 
in other words, the scope. Uh, there's a very strong link with the public procurement directives. Lots of terminology is also copy pasted from these public procurement directives from 2014. There's also some what I think is unnecessary red tape in terms of better lawmaking. Um, for instance, references to the fact that an award of contract can take place or must take place based on award criteria that exempt the uh, economically most advantageous tender. This is simply law. There's no reason why this regulation should repeat it or cause potential conflicts between other fields of law. The EU institutions are not bound. Procurements outside of the public procurement directives, defense procurement is also exempted. Interestingly, also it's clarified that uh, for framework agreements, the initial tender to set up the agreement does fall under its scope. The mini competitions that could follow afterwards uh, are exempt. And the, 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 the regulation also introduces words such as multi-stage procedures, procedures in which multiple selections take place. And, and based on that, there is a, a likelihood that a double administrative burden is placed on these entities, so they check twice. But perhaps even more importantly, um, and, and Ursula already mentioned it, but I'll be a bit more specific um, here, is that there's thresholds, right? A relatively high number. So only contracts that equal or go beyond 250 um, a million. So um, even though there's also this, this sub-condition of, you know, if an, if an economic operator applies for individual lots, um, or the aggregate value of those specific lots that have been um, chosen by a contracting authority, that is half, so it's 125 million, but still uh, the majority would just go for the main test, the 250 million, which means that we're really talking about uh, the big tenders, right? We're talking about major infrastructural projects, major rollout of IT, big procurements. Um, particularly if one thinks that the thresholds to uh, bring into effect the public procurement directives for works projects, they're also they're only related at approximately five million for um, for services is about two hundred thousand, right? So there's a major difference between these thresholds. These are really only aimed at targeting the big contracts. You know? And finally, in terms of scope, and that's <clears throat> in a way interesting because the, the regulation. Uh, explicitly clarifies that it only relates to a specific procurement procedure. So the effect that it might have, which um, procedurally um, Thomas, my colleague, uh, highlighted already, say if you're rejected from a procedure that, or if you've had to offer commitments, etc., the, the, the uh, regulation clearly specifies that that should not have an effect on future procedures. Right? question will be if that's actually what will be happening, but on paper that is uh, the case. Um, then if we zoom in a little bit more, when we look at the actual procedural aspects of this, um, of this piece of, uh, of legislation, um, we see that <clears throat> there's a twofold step or two positions can be taken. When the thresholds are met, we talk about notification. When they're not met, we talk about declaration. Both are sent to the commission and um, it, it means that there will be a heavy burden, I think, right? Even though the, the, the threshold is quite high, in essence, this, this could mean that the capacity of the commission at least will be burdened administratively, perhaps not so much as how uh, comparatively when we compare it to the administrative burdens for contracting authorities who would need to go through this for every tender, right? Um, but that's, it's quite a substantial piece of, um, of admin that gets added to the functioning of all actors involved. Interestingly enough, that is also exemplified by the fact that the, the regulation also captures main subcontractors and main suppliers. So I think much will be discussed in the future about what are actually subcontractors that are qualified as main criterion or main suppliers. At the moment, the regulation refers to key elements, right? So it could revolve around staff, know-how, technology, if you perform the majority of the contract or if you contribute 20 to 20% of the value of it. Um, but those entities are also required to, um, to, to, to be transparent about their financial bookkeeping. Uh, so this could also be entities outside of the um, operating outside of the EU. Um, interestingly, as another point is that 
there's a procedural check should the submission be incomplete. And I think this is already uh, in terms of uh, this is expectation management from the EU legislator. If you look at the implementation regulation, which is very detailed, uh, Jasper already highlighted the, the need for specific um, to really have your your financials in order. I think how specific the, the how specific the regulation is getting. I think this also means that we'll see a lot of incomplete submissions, right? Now, public procurement law is often deemed or characterized, and rightly so, as being very rigid procedural work, right? If you tick one wrong box or if you have one autograph in the wrong place, you're out or your bid is disqualified. So I think it's interesting here that there's room for recovery, right? We have a 10 day period, either if we're in the phase at the, the commission or at the contracting authority to, to, um, to, to repair such incompleteness. Um, another aspect that's, I think, of, of interest here is the fact that the commission can still request notification if it deems it suspicious, right? How, what is suspicious in this regulation is not clearly defined, but I think that just underlines the point that Thomas made about the expanding power of the commission here. Um, and it limits the assessment of abnormally low tenders explicitly. So contracting authorities that have to assess abnormally low tenders now, uh, should that be clearly caused by a foreign subsidy, do not need to assess that anymore. That needs to be dealt with by the commission. And of course, most importantly, the post award review possibilities, right? The ex officio investigations. Now, that's limited to uh, not to termination of the contract, right? So only commitments could be demanded. So, in a way, the impact there is limited, but still that causes, I think, issues. And I'll, and I'll come to that. And to close off, um, the investigation, there's a standstill on award. The procedure can continue, uh, but the award cannot take place until the, the uh, procedure has, has closed. So, there's a preliminary review for which we have 20 days and plus 10 days under exceptional circumstances, or an in depth investigation, which can take 110 days plus 20 days again. Right. So it's quite a lengthy time, right? It's nearly um, it can go a bit over eight months. And the outcome there, um, as was highlighted before, can be commitments, no further action in different stages, uh, but also fines, right? We're in public procurement, uh, which are generally deemed to be either purely contractual civil law arrangements or administrative uh, decisions, depending on how it's regulated on the member state level, we're really not so much used to enforcement from, from, this, from this angle. With with these high fines, so I think there's some definitely some teeth there. So even though I could not restrain myself from being critical just then, I've tried to stay relatively objective. Now I think I'll leave you with five points. Uh, my first question here is effectiveness, and mostly if the role of public procurement is really proven to be the most effective policy tool to effectuate such um, uh, such trade. Policies, and I think uh, this is also highly contextual because uh, this, I think, it can be seen as yet another role for public procurement. And what do I mean by that? Is public procurement, in a sense, because of its high economic value and because of it, makes a lot of sense also from a political standpoint, right? To kill two birds with one stone, we're already spending the money. Why not achieve also other policy objectives? And, but we're seeing that in a lot of fields, right? So. Think about equality, human rights enforcement, down supply chains, non discrimination, proportionality, the fight against climate change, CO2 reduction, climate neutral uh, purchasing, um, enforcing access to foreign, um, foreign third countries uh, for EU bidders through the interna international procurement instrument, sanctions to Russia, uh, long term unemployment needs to be covered by by procurement. We need to spur innovation through it. So and I could go on and on. Right. You could see aesthetically the list. I was making the list very long, but I could make it even longer. So I think that poses two questions is is public procurement really the, the, the key to overcoming this obstacle? Right. This gap that that my colleague um, Jasper Slice was talking about. Because uh, generally uh, the, the research that we have doesn't necessarily unanimously point toward that direction. And I think to overcomplicate it, when you combine all these different goals, that even increases the potential for ineffectiveness. So on top of that, a lot of these um, policy objectives were initially voluntary, 
a contracting authority could decide to enforce human rights. It could decide to put an emphasis on unemployment. But what we're seeing now is we're also seeing a trend towards more mandatory requirements. So a lot of green requirements are coming out of the EU Green Deal, which means that it's actually not a choice anymore, but they, in practice, contracting authorities will be uh, forced to take into account a lot of different policy objectives, right? So I'm not even talking about capacity or budget here, but more practically, right? Us as lawyers, how do we deal with that? And what's effective law? So if I move to the scope, second point that I'd like to raise, I find it, it, it's questionable why the EU institutions were not taking into the scope of this. To a certain extent, one could argue why not practice uh, what you preach? Defense were taken out for a great amount, um, even though the exemption for framework agreements makes a lot of sense. I think a lot of the, the rationale that's taken up in this regulation could equally apply to those exemptions. So I think that could be something for the future. Um, more legally speaking, I think, and I discussed this, this, this criterion of unduly favorable already, um, the, the starting point of a chapter on public procurement, the way that the, the regulation describes this almost makes it out that any type of foreign subsidy that meets the threshold, so if the threshold of 250 and 4 million are met, it, if I read those criteria in the public procurement setting, it's likely that any distortion will already meet that threshold. And what I mean by that is if we're talking about contracts of 250 million and above, that generally means something about for the market or market composition. So it means that there won't be a lot of players active that would be able to execute such a big contract. So not many could do it. And if I look at the criteria that are now mentioned for distortion, amount of subsidy, nature of subsidy, but also the type of undertaking and the size of the market, the level and evolution of economic activity, the purpose and the conditions, et cetera. Right? So I think it's likely that most will qualify as actually unduly favorable, meaning that this could become a hollow concept. Moving on from there, there's some, some other aspects that I think require, require attention. When we look at uh, the, how broad the, the net is that's being cast for information requests, also competitors need to abide by requests from the, um, from the, the commission. And to some extent, perhaps some people in the audience can, can, can enlighten me here, I'm unsure why that would be required and how that actually can be remedied with the principle of proportionality, right? That a competitor also would need to disclose financials uh, even though um, no foreign aid was, was, was given. Moving on to delays and uncertainty, and this is, I think, a major point for practice at the moment, is um, if one would not include legal cases or legal review cases based on the decisions that are made by the contracting authorities or the national courts or the commission, I think a balance that must continuously be taken into account, particularly when the commission prioritizes its work in this field, is major delays for essential services and works in society, right? So the commission needs to be effective here. Um, because ultimately, what I think will happen is that many procedures will be halted because of the risk of um, one entity being kicked out of the procedure. A contracting authority will likely halt the procedure, even though it has the right to continue it until award. Uh, purely for efficiency sake, um, that uncertainty, I think, will halt a lot of um, uh, procedures. Um, on top of that, the ex officio reviews, even though <clears throat> its, its effects are limited, as I mentioned, I think that would still put a little, little bit of a bomb under the cooperation, right? Particularly because the lifespan, either three or 10 years of the review period, is still quite long. Um, the contract might have finished already, but uh, you know, there, I think there's an issue there as well in terms of uncertainty of what will happen, right? If the commission still intervenes in a co contract that's already been awarded and concluded. For administrative burdens, which I think will be very onerous, because ultimately, if every single entity needs to work with this, it's another form in a public procurement procedure, which already uh, involves a lot of paperwork and a lot of paper realities. Right? So my proposal would be here is why not link up with the European single procurement document? This is a document that is already being used in public procurement quite in, in every tender, right? In which it's a self-declaration for economic operators, 
Um, and now if I look at the implementing regulation of the foreign subsidies regulation, another 24 pages to fill out, including subcontractors and main suppliers. And I think the question will be how effective will all of this be in the future, right? Will we look back on this as the second example of uh, when we decentralize state aid enforcement as well, when the commission could not cope with many of the uh, requests, right? So I think this might be an aspect that will also uh, be uh, relevant for future days to come. And I'll close off with uh, with legal protection. It's, I think, interesting that again, um, we see no role for national supervisory authorities, particularly also the Netherlands was very much against it. Whereas I think in a more decentralized or half decentralized role that could have definitely played some uh, effective role in enforce enforcement here, but in public procurement, we seem to not be able to get that off the ground or at least not up until now. We'll see, I think, a lot more uh, cases in which comp in which uh, entities will challenge based on uh, 263, right, the, 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 the direct procedures, but also, and I think that will be more challenging, particularly because it's a regulation, is also discussions before the national courts um, or if they can even go to national courts. Um, and this is particularly discussed in the Netherlands at the moment, is it's to be expected that claims of competitors will rise, come up. Right, so a competitor stating that they didn't declare, they should have notified, or this entity is in fact a main subcontractor and not just a normal subcontractor. So such procedural aspects, I think we will need to go through the national courts, but um, the regulation at the moment refers to nothing about this, right? So there's, I think, uh, some some need to 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 increase legal certainty also when it comes to legal protection, particularly for entities that are indirectly affected. Yeah. All right. I'll come to a close and I'll, I'll pass the floor back to 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 Ursula. What I've tried to do is give you some some insights into uh, some procedural aspects of this um, regulation from a, a public procurement perspective. I think also some aspects that require attention. Relating to legal protection, administrative burdens, delays and uncertainty, the scope, and also underlying all of this, the effectiveness of public procurement uh, in, the, in this sense. And I hope that might spark some some questions for uh, for the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Willem, for your presentation. We now move to Anna Anna Marholt. Hi. Okay. There you are. Hey. Thank you, Ursula. Um, I would like to request whether you or perhaps Willem can um, change the slides for me as I've of been course. as a guest right now. So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anna Marhold. I'm an assistant professor in international trade law and specifically energy regulation at Leiden University. So I'm a, uh, an external contributor to this uh, fascinating workshop. Thank you very much for uh, including me. Um, so I will briefly cover, first of all, um, the WTO and the role of the EU in the WTO, and the rationale, the interaction. Um, of course, the whole goal of the presentation is to talk about the interaction of uh, the subsidies agreement with um, the um, FSR. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the rationale of uh, the ASCM agreement, so the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures um, in the WTO. Um, then I'll discuss the internet action of the ASCM um, with the FSR and some issues that are definitely controversial and definitely have not been solved. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how both the WTO and the EU will go about that. Um, and I also want to link it back, and I've already heard that, uh, for instance, from Thomas, et cetera, to some of the bigger questions that we're grappling with, certainly in times of uh, geopolitical fragmentation, et cetera. All right, so um, perhaps we can go. Um, no, wait, not not yet. We can still stay. <laughs> we can still stay here. So um, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, is of course um, the international organization that uh, deals with the regulation of international trade. It's built around three pillars, mainly um, trade in goods, trade in services, and trade in intellectual property rights. Um, if we look at the WTO, um, you could say it is a organization that is there to promote free trade. However, um, one of the major elements that is actually missing from the WTO because it's so hard to uh, regulate internationally are any rules on competition policy. 
You could say that the rules on subsidies um, as well as anti-dumping are, let's say, the closest one could get on an international compromise when it comes to competition-like or competition-related policies um, in the multilateral um, trading framework. Um, the European Union is, of course, an interesting animal when it comes uh, to uh, membership to the WTO, as because of, uh, let's say, the separate competences, it's both the Union itself that is a member to the World Trade Organization and its separate member states. Why is that? That is because, of course, you have um, several issues that still fall within the competences within the purview of the member states, uh, despite the fact that we're often discussing um, issues concerning common commercial policy. If you look at the European Union, furthermore, within, let's say, the GATT, uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, we are talking about a customs union in, in line with Article 24 of the GATT, which makes it an exception to most favored nation treatment. So in this sense, the EU as an actor within the WTO is, of course, unique. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see that also with respect to um, the foreign subsidies regulation. Um, when we look at the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, as I said, it was more or less a compromise with regard to um, rules that resemble competition. The whole rationale of the agreement was, of course, to try and curb or at least constrain members' use of subsidies if they affect negatively international trade. It's all about, of course, uh, measures that affect international trade liberalization. Um, so those subsidies that affect international trade um, are regulated. The interesting thing, there are several interesting dimensions so on the rules of subsidies regulation in, uh, in the WTO. First of all, um, it doesn't prohibit subsidization per se. It just nicely categorizes different types of subsidies and their regulation and um, attached consequences. Um, and it's also important to know that the AACM falls within the agreement um, within the agreements of trade in goods. So the AACM falls under Annex 1A of the GATT trade in goods agreements, meaning, what does it mean? That there is no rules constraining subsidies on services in the World Trade Organization, which is, of course, there where the EU FSR tries to fill the gap, as is um, clear. Um, so the rationale of the ACM was to at least um, constrain that. What do we see if we look at the definition of a subsidy, which is taken up in Article 1.1 of the AS ASM agreement? We see that um, in the WTO, a subsidy exists if there is a financial contribution by a government or any public body within the territory of a member, or if there's any form of income or price support in the sense of Article 16 of the GATT, and thereby a benefit is conferred. So that is the, uh, the definition for subsidy in, uh, the, in, in the ASCM agreement. Um, moreover, it's very important to understand that subsidies um, to be actionable or to be uh, disputed in the WTO, they have to be specific. So Article 1.2 of the SCM provides that a subsidy as defined in paragraph 1 shall be subject to the provisions of Part 2 or shall be subject to the provisions of Part 3 and 4 only if such a subsidy is deemed specific in accordance with the provisions of Article 2. This means that any type of programs that would subsidize anything throughout the whole economy would not deem to be specific and therefore not uh, prohibited or actionable in um, the under the SCM agreement. Now it's also important to know that um, WTO law and regulations remain very broad. That means that most of the issues are being clarified in dispute settlement, just as we see in competition law. And that means that there is a whole body of case law in the WTO that will define exactly what a financial contribution is, what government is, what benefit is, and what specificity is. Um, this can be very detailed with regard to the transfer of funds, um, government revenue foregone, provision of purchase by an agreement, etc. So there is really um, a lot of um, detail and, uh, on WTO case law on each of these elements to see 
when something does qualify as a subsidy. Um, what can you do when there is um, a subsidy? So what is very interesting is that there is only two possible reactions under the WTO, meaning also for the EU, to react to prohibited and actionable subsidies. I will discuss what the, the, the difference is between prohibited. Now you can still go back for a little bit. You can still go back for a <laughs> if it's possible. Thank you. Uh, I wish I had control, but unfortunately. Um, um, what you can do against prohibited and actionable subsidies. Namely, you can either um, go and settle your dispute multilaterally under the dispute settlement, uh, understanding in the dispute settlement system, meaning that you, um, if, if you uh, are suffering, if you as a WTO member are suffering from um, a subsidized good in your market or have adverse effects, you can actually go and start a case uh, in the WTO dispute settlement system against uh, the WTO member you accuse of subsidizing. Um, this is the multilateral option, but there's also a unilateral option, meaning that you can impose countervailing duties um, on subsidized products if there are three conditions fulfilled. First of all, there have to be subsidized imports, so meaning those are, um, um, you know, producers who benefited from specific subsidies. There has to be injury to the domestic industry. And there has to be a causal link between the subsidized imports and the injury to the domestic industry and injury caused by other factors that is not attributed to the subsidized imports. So what, if you meet those um, conditions, you may impose countervailing duties, which are, of course, uh, um, taken up in the EU anti-subsidies regulation. So it's to, for, up to each and every WTO member state to then enact regulations uh, that give effect um, to um, the rules and regulations and the procedural aspects of imposing um, countervailing duties. So I'm saying again, these are the only two options for WTO members under the SEM agreement to take action. And we'll come back to this later. Now, we can go to the next slide now. And in the next slide, I just briefly want to highlight the different types of subsidies that we know under the ASEM. So under the um, agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, there are two main categories of subsidies that are regulated in the WTO and one lapsed category that's also worth mentioning. First of all, we have prohibited subsidies. Those are contingent on exports. So any subsidies that are specifically provided by a WTO member um, contingent on export are by definition prohibited. And also um, local content requirements. So any types of subsidies that require the use of a locally produced good, for instance, would also be prohibited by definition under the WTO. Um, if such subsidies are in place, the WTO member has a lower burden of proof and can go and um, um, start a dispute or um, institute uh, CBDs against these types of subsidies. Now, the biggest um, uh, portion of subsidies globally are actually actionable because, as I said earlier, it do the WTO doesn't prohibit uh, the regulation of subsidies and it doesn't prohibit subsidies per se, but they shouldn't have adverse effects on trade. So if you look at actionable subsidies under the SEM, they are generally allowed, but they shouldn't cause adverse effects. If they do cause adverse effects to another WTO member under Article 5, the WTO member can go and challenge those subsidies again or impose uh, CBDs when those requirements are met. The WTO system doesn't have, uh, just like let's say um, in EU competition law, some, a public uh, centralized body that will go and proactively monitor how WTO members are implementing um, their laws. No, it's a dispute settlement based system. So if there is no dispute, there is no problem. But there, if, if there is a dispute, there is obviously a problem. When we look at non-actionable subsidies, this category is worth mentioning because there used to be a category of subsidies that was, in fact, excluded originally from um, being regulated by the WTO. So they were non-actionable. They could not be, um, uh, there, no action could be taken against them in the WTO. And those were subsidies with particular policy reasons, such as environmental concerns. 
This is interesting because this article has lapsed because also developing countries are very much opposed to these types of subsidies. Um, and um, this is one of the main criticisms for saying that the WTO rules on subsidies are outdated, together with the fact that it only regulates the subsidization of goods and not the subsidization of services. So this is important to keep in mind. All right, we can go to the next slide. So when we look at the foreign subsidies regulation and the WTO ACM, there is in fact still quite a lot of uncertainty and unclarity and friction at the moment. Where does that friction lie? Well, the scope, the most obvious scope is the scope issue. So the EU foreign subsidies regulation, of course, attempts to capture a much wider scope than the ASCM. And in that sense, you could say it is another one of those developments where there where multilateral action is lacking. You have the regional trading blocks taking action and um, going further and being more progressive on the rules. This is not only negative, it can have a positive effect in the sense that uh, perhaps these kind of approaches or the rules that are drafted can be multilateralized at some point in the future if we're ever going there again. We see that the Euro foreign subsidies regulation talks about economic activity, which um, is clearly broader than just um, goods, which would be covered by the ACM, because it also deals with subsidized investments, and services and financial flows. So the um, foreign subsidies regulation does try to also capture uh, subsidized um, services, something that the uh, ASCM has been unable to do. Um, so the foreign subsidy regulation also allows for a very broad range of measures to counter uh, subsidies. It has these uh, various tools that it can use, so it has these in investigative and balancing effects. And this is where things become a bit more tricky. Why? Well, if you remember a slide ago, I was telling you that under the WTO, there's only two actions you can take as WTO member to counter actionable or prohibited subsidies on goods, which were those you can either start a case in WTO dispute settlement, or if you meet the conditions, you can start, you can um, um, uh, impose CVDs, so countervailing duties. It does not mention the fact that you have all these other tools um, that the EU now is proposing. So while the EU uh, foreign subsidies regulation mentions in its recital 69 article 44.9 that it all complies or that it should comply with the WTO agreement, this is not very clear. And you could very well argue that definitely in those uh, elements that trade uh, concern trading goods, um, that the EU is in fact unilaterally deciding that it has more tools in its toolbox than what would be allowed under WTO law. So when it considers uh, subsidized goods, the foreign subsidies regulation does actually run contrary to Article 32.1 of the ACM, which actually stipulates that there's only these two remedies to uh, subsidized goods. What is also unclear in the sense is the relationship with Regulation um, 161037, uh, so this uh, EU anti-subsidy regulation that actually gives effect to regulating um, countervailing duties um, for the EU. So uh, it says that um, this, that the FSR is without prejudice to this regulation, but what that, does that mean? It's great language without prejudice, but it basically is quite unclear or there might be overlap or there's action possible under both regulations. This is unclear and it's not clear how the commission wants to solve this and if it at all, uh, you know, plans to solve this or we'll just have to wait and see. Um, yes, we can go to the next slide. And this all basically brings me to some bigger issues when we talk about uh, dispute settlement in this area. So imagine that another WTO member would like to start a case against uh, the EU for, for um, issues that concern the foreign subsidies regulation, where would that then lead? We all might know that um, the Apple, the body of the World Trade Organization, 
is currently completely ineffective, um, which means that if you want to appeal a case in front of the WTO, you're appealing into the void. Unless you can settle your dispute under the multi-party interim agreement, but there's only a small number of um, WTO members party to that agreement. So it's this interim agreement to try and solve the appellate body crisis. Um, so that means that um, for the EU, in a sense, that's good, not good for multilateralism, but good for the foreign subsidies regulation, in the sense that um, we are moving into this era of geoeconomic fragmentation and more unilateral action. Um, and there is no, not much um, another WTO member could do because it would appeal, the EU would appeal the case into the void. And that means that um, there would be no solution in under the multilateral trading rules in the WTO to a dispute um, based on the EU foreign subsidies regulation. Um, so we do see that this UFSR also really fits into um, the developments of having a diminishing importance of multilateral trading rules, uh, geopolitical blocks that will define whatever they're doing. And I think it's also relevant to see also the paradoxes here. So that's something that Thomas also mentioned. So on the one hand, that we want to counter foreign subsidies, sometimes with probably very good reasons. But on the other hand, we also want to counter um, the Inflation Reduction Act with our own EU green industrial plan. So we do think national or regional subsidies in this sense um, are acceptable. Uh, I think it's very interesting to see where this uh, develops also with regard to uh, consistency or inconsistency with the ASCM agreement, um, and, um, especially with subsidization of goods and the FSR and the interaction with the regulation on the anti-subsidy regulation of the EU, and generally whether this is just another sign of uh, the downfall of multilateralism in trade relations, uh, which can, as I said, have some positive effects because at least you can say something is developing somewhere, so maybe there's in the end a takeaway, namely that we can take away maybe more advanced uh, rules on subsidies and subsidized services and how to counter those. So I hope that this was at least a useful background and I very much look forward to the final questions and discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anna. Um, now I open uh, the floor for questions. So if there are any questions, I see. Any questions? Yes, I see Oscar. Please go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Perfect. I have a question for uh, Dr. Jensen. Um, in your presentation on public procurement, you mentioned that contracting authorities may halt procedures when the uh, review is opened. Um, why is that? Is that because they may open themselves to claims of discrimination? Um, if, if I'm just looking quickly at the chair, I'll just tackle this question straight away. Or so if that's all right there with you, um, I, I, it's a good question and it's also uncertain, right? But I think um, many of the contracting authorities that I've spoken to that tend to such big contracts do have a tendency to think that they will hold them, um, mostly because of the fact that they might end up with a, um, a situation where the winning bidder is actually kicked out of the <clears throat> out of the procedure. And even though the, the, the regulation makes some arrangements for, uh, you know, a, a, the winning uh, the contract then going to number two, I think that that's one risky because it or to a certain extent also preventable because you could have uh, noted that in your contract in your in your tender documents. Um, but Unfortunately, many contracting authorities still use relative relative scoring techniques, meaning that if one bidder gets kicked out, the number two could actually not be number two, but it might be number three. And then you run the risk of, uh, like you say, transparency or perhaps even discrimination or equality questions, and you might need to retender the bid altogether. So I think because of the risk of um, of, of losing a winning a winning bidder, 
Um, I think there is a chance that procedures will be halted, but like I said, I mean, it'll, it, it, it's ultimately up to the discretion of the contracting authority because they do have the right to continue until the, until the award of contract, right? Because that, the standstill is still there, but they can continue through all those different steps of a procedure accordingly to the procedure that they've chosen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Willem. I see uh, Pierre Francesco have a question. Yes, uh, good uh, good evening. I'm Pier Francesco from the University of Antwerp. I have uh, two questions regarding the public procurement. And first of all, thank you for the clear uh, overview. My questions are, uh, first you have mentioned the IPI and my I would be curious to understand how maybe the FSR uh, could interact with the IPI. And also with the second question, we have mentioned that uh, the IRA uh, of the Biden's administration is inspiring and maybe also frightening EU decision makers. And it has been triggering this whole discussion about our uh, the relaxation of uh, state aid rules. Uh, the IRA is also, um, uh, it entails also a Buy American uh, principle and I mean, an enlargement of that already existing principle. And I'm thinking if Brussels decision makers will also be inspired by Washington regarding that. If we may have also by European rules in public procurement in the future. And maybe I have also a question uh, to Dr. Marhold about uh, um, FSR and the, its interplays with WTO law. I'm thinking, are there any um, initiatives uh, regarding WTO reform, so the multilateral uh, multilateral uh, for, fora about maybe a reform of WTO rules on subsidies that can maybe address some of the issues that the EU wanted to tackle from a unilateral way? Could it be possible to imagine some multilateral solution to the same issues? Thank you very much. Willem? Would you like to reflect? Um, yes, uh, thank you for your um, thank you for your question. Um, uh, I, I think I can be brief because I think uh, at least on paper the FSR states that there's no conflict with this um, with the IPI, the International Procurement Instrument. Um, whether that's the case in practice, uh, that that's that's to be to be seen, but. I don't expect a lot of overlap here, mostly because the objectives of the instruments are very different, right? One is to maintain a level playing field in the internal market, the FSR, whereas the others is really externally focused. It's um, it's really to reopen or to initiate negotiations with external third countries and to, to gain access there, right? So closed off procurement markets abroad could now be opened up uh, through the through the IPI. Uh, in general, I, I do think it, it it shows that international procurement and the external effects of procurement law are becoming more, I think, prevalent, right? So I think in in in, in that case, I think you're on the money when you think about both of them in the same in the same breath. In relation to your your second question, I think that that's also how I would envision that. I think the IPI is really something that will uh, that could have the potential to break open by by national legislation. Um, but I don't think it will it will get that far ultimately because uh, to be honest, I think most uh, foreign powers that have such by by uh, national legislation have such a long tradition, whether it's China, whether it's uh, Brazil, whether it's the US with such specific legislation, whether they're generally focused or really specific for veterans or small business and medium sized enterprises. So I don't see that coming unless all of this fails. Right then, a, a fallback option could be is to say we need to have buy European um, uh, options. Um, so that's uh, my answer to your two questions, and maybe I can pass the floor back to to Anna. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, question. So um, subsidy reform discussions are have been taking place for maybe ten years, especially in policy circles surrounding the WTO. Everybody agrees that the rules are outdated, that the rules as they are now, for instance, don't take into account the rationale of certain subsidies. Um, and there is also a lot of talk, for instance, of including or somehow monitoring fossil fuel subsidies within the WTO. So there is definitely an understanding and the need that reform of subsidy rules is needed. However, 
just with many other, just as with many other things in the WTO, um, a lot of it is stuck on the multilateral level. We're dealing with an organization that has 164 members. It's becoming more and more politicized. You know, security exceptions are being invoked, etc. So um, it's very hard to get anything done multilaterally at present. So while you will find tons of policy papers with suggesting how to improve subsidy rules, in practice, um, it seems unlikely that anything will change in the near future. What could be a solution is to negotiate a plurilateral agreement where you can have, uh, those are kind of of minority in interests, so they don't have to be multilateralized and they can um, exist for a subset of WTO members. So they can have a smaller um, group of WTO members that would agree on a particular topic. Um, and then perhaps in the end, more and more members can join. So if anything happens uh, with regard to subsidies regulation, it would happen and within the WTO, I think, on a plur plurilateral level. And that is why um, it is, in fact, important. I mean, it's worrisome that we're go going away from multilateralism into these uh, geopolitical blocks. But it is in these geopolitical blocks where everything happens, right? It is now the EU that makes the advanced rules. So um, we can also see that as, you know, if it works well, perhaps in a utopian future, well, when multilateralism is all back, the WTO might actually use some of these rules um, and draw on them and when really, you know, agreeing on some, some new rules. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Anna. Other questions? Now I'm looking also at our speakers, whether you would like to add something or perhaps have questions to other speakers. No, I see Jasper, Anna, Willem, Thomas. No? Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I would like to thank our excellent speakers uh, for their perspectives and insights and many thanks to our audience for the interesting questions and the discussion. Um, I think after the uh, the presentations, we actually have um, uh, more questions than before. Um, so um, I was taking notes for myself what kind of aspects I should still point out, and I think there have been <laughs> too many to actually summarize them. We we heard about overlap, we have about friction, uncertainty, uh, suitability um, of the action, we have about uh, a uh, tremendously rising transaction costs, what Jasper mentioned, uh, and uh, and the fact that we are, might be moving into the du dual system of merger control. Um, we um, heard Thomas um, underscoring this this wide ranging powers and discretion given to the Commission by means of the regulation, and uh, the very interesting question regarding judicial review, which, by the way, have been has been emphasized by actually all of the speakers. So, so what's going to happen? What's going to happen um, now? Um, so very exciting times ahead, I would say, and um, and definitely a lot of uh, work for both academics and and practitioners in that respect. Um, on a final note, I would like to, um, to tell you that we are going to also write a symposium blog on this topic. Uh, so regarding the, the perspectives that, that were shared today on the regulation, I can't tell you uh, the exact date when it's going to happen, but we are happy to keep you in the loop uh, on this. And uh, we are also happy to share the, the recording and the slides with you. So this one, um, you can expect an information uh, from us on this. If there are no more questions, then um, thank you very much again. Have a great afternoon, night, uh, good night, Jasper. And uh, well, I hope to see you uh, in on different occasions discussing either the foreign subsidies regulation further, because I think there is still lots of room for further discussion or any other related issue. Thank you very much.